All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. It's the top of the hour. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with our webinar today. So I'm gonna welcome everyone to the first Eat Lack webinar in our series, The Science of Fermentation. I'm Erin DiCaprio, I'm an Assistant Specialist in Cooperative Extension in the Department of Food Science and Technology at UC Davis and the UC Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Eat Lack stands for Evaluating and Testing Lacto-Fermentations Across the Country, and it's the name of a project led by scientists in the UC Davis Department of Food Science and Technology. So the goals of this project are to expand our collective knowledge of fermentation and provide accurate information related to the production of fermented foods. So we want to help you understand what you're buying and eating when you invest in fermented foods and, that, and provide information that will encourage you hopefully to try fermenting at home. So this webinar series and our project is made possible by a grant from the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Specialty Crop, Crop, Crop Block Grant Program. Um, so obviously we're, we're using Zoom as the platform for this webinar series. We will be muting all participants for the duration of the webinar. And so we encourage you to ask questions via the chat function if you have any that come up um, during the webinar. We are asking that you keep your video off um, during the webinar, just to help keep the webinar flow. Uh, we will be addressing many of the questions that were pre-submitted when you registered um, for the webinar, as well as those questions that come up in the chat at the conclusion of the presentation um, for today. Some of the questions that come in um, may be more relevant to future webinars, so we'll hold those and address those um, in the future as applicable. After uh, today's webinar, I'm going to be putting a link to a Qualtrics survey in the chat. So we would really appreciate you taking the time to complete the survey and give us feedback on uh, the webinar that we're presenting here today. The webinar for today is entitled, What is a Fermented Food? Um, and so the goal here is to define fermented foods and explain the microbiology of these types of foods. So today we'll have a 30 minute presentation from our speaker, followed by showing a short, approximately five minute video uh, related to producing fruits and vegetables at home. After that video is finished, we'll have approximately uh, 10 minutes of time for questions and answers, and then we'll conclude um, the webinar providing information related to that survey I mentioned, as well as giving some information on our upcoming webinar for next week. So the speaker for today is Professor Maria Marco, a microbiologist in the Food Science and Technology Department at UC Davis. Professor Marco's lab has worked for years on understanding the microorganisms responsible for fermenting a wide variety of foods and ways to improve the fermentation process. Her research group also investigates the role of consuming fermented foods, fiber, and probiotics on human health. So with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Professor Marco. Thank you, Erin, and welcome everybody. It's really wonderful to join you here today in our first of our three webinar series. Um, and before I really launch into um, describing what a fermented food is, I want to share my screen. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, so uh, I want to share, uh, the project team and just take a moment to uh, firstly uh, to acknowledge CDFA for supporting this work and secondly Erin who uh, is uh, has been an amazing partner <laughs> um, in developing our program and uh, it's really been a, a team effort. Um, beyond that and really the heart of our program here is our students and so I want to acknowledge them uh, uh, shown here, um, Peter Finnegan, who received his bachelor degree um, over a year ago, uh, Natty Ribirio, who's a new PhD student, 
actually still in Brazil waiting to get a visa <laughs> to start her program, but has been working on the project since last April. And then our amazing undergraduate team in food science. Um, <clears throat> All of our team members are home for mentors, so <laughs> they've also been inspiration. Um, Zoe, his son, Raya, and Hannah, um, and before Amanda, really brought to uh, our, our group um, amazing insight. And um, I think it's particularly important to point out now during the pandemic where you know, we've really had to refocus and think about how we're going to um, communicate and work with you and um, achieve our goals of the project um, when, uh, you know, during these really challenging times. And, and one aspect of this that I think is really um, shown through is um, our, our social media. So um, I just want to put a plug for that now to um, do reach out um, either through email at eatlath at ucdavis.edu or through our Facebook um, um, page and or Instagram um, or, or as well as our website. So a little bit more about what we're doing at, at the end here. But, but for the outline uh, of what I want to cover with you for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, be, what is a fermented food? What needs to happen to make a fermented food? And as a microbiologist, I like to interject, what does a fermentation look like from a microbial perspective? And to leave you with, what is next? What should we be looking for in ferment food fermentation science? So in thinking about what is a fermented food, uh, you may recognize yogurt as being a fermented food. It's probably one of the most recognized uh, foods in the US known to be fermented. Perhaps you might also think of beer, wine, um, as a fermented food, fermented beverage. Perhaps you would know that certain meats are fermented. Uh, for example, pepperoni is a fermented food. Coffee, one of my favorite beverages, is a fermented food. You may or may not know that there are foods like natto that are um, uh, fermented, it's fermented soybeans made uh, traditionally in Japan, or perhaps hakro, a fermented shark made in Iceland. There are literally thousands of fermented foods made around the world today, um, at least 5,000, but that's, that's an underestimate because every uh, culture every corner of the globe, every continent has a fermented food as a staple. So what can we come up with a definition that would cover such a huge variety of foods? Of course, different flavors, uh, different textures, different starting ingredients, but here's the definition. So fermented foods are defined as foods and beverages made through desired microbial growth and enzymatic conversions of food components. This is a definition that's not new. It's just maybe tweaked a little bit to um, bring out certain words. If you're in a, a food science or a, a course, <laughs> you might know this definition generally, but I want to come back to certain points on it. Um, and just to note, this definition was recently published um, uh, in a, uh, consensus article, sort of a summary article on fermented foods uh, put together by uh, the International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics, of which I'm a member of uh, on the board. And so this definition pulls together elements and this paper pulls together elements that are uh, valuable for understanding what a fermented food is. And I think it's particularly salient to also kind of think about other meanings for the word ferment or fermentation. Uh, so it has many meanings and, and that's why we're making it uh, and elevating the importance of defining what a fermented food is here in, in this uh, webinar. So um, ferment, the word, originates from Latin fervor to boil. Uh, According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, ferment is to undergo fermentation or to be in a state of agitation or intense activity. So those of you who are familiar with uh, Sander Katz's work and his new recently 
published book, um, Fermentation as a Metaphor, you see how a wonderfully he plays on that word and as we think about that term just to mean ferment. Fermentation can be defined, it has been defined as chemical change with effervescence. In industry, fermentation means the intentional use of cells to make useful products such as drugs or antibiotics. In biochemistry, fermentation is understood as an ATP generating process in which organic compounds act as both electron donors and acceptors. So you can see there's multiple meanings here. That's why we want to stay centered on this the idea of fermented foods as being foods and beverages made as a result of desired microbial growth and enzymatic activity. Uh, I'm going to go back. <laughs> made through desired microbial growth and enzymatic conversion of food components. I wanted to get that right. So encompassed in this definition is the possibility of using different energy metabolism pathways. So with this, sometimes it's a confusing point, is that microorganisms can use uh, multiple pathways for growth, um, which, which they require energy. One is through fermentation, so fermentation metabolism, and that's shown here on the left. So we could start with compounds like sugars, glucose is an example, and microbes get energy, or ATP, through the breakdown of glucose. In fermentation pathways, we can end up with lactic acid or acetic acid. We might also end up with ethanol as an alcoholic fermentation. Also included in our fermented foods are foods made through microbial growth in which respiratory metabolism could be used, either aerobic, as in the case of oxygen being used, or anaerobic, for example, nitrate. Just as I breathe in and out, my body is using respiratory pathways right now. The same for microorganisms. Again, you could start with a compound like glucose, a sugar, break it down, and through respiratory metabolism, break it the whole way down to carbon dioxide as I breathe out, and using oxygen as the terminal electron acceptor through an electron transport system. So the definition of fermented foods includes both fermentative metabolism and respiratory metabolism. Fermented metabolism, we might think of our lacto-fermented fruits and vegetables or alcoholic fermentation, alcoholic beverages. For respiratory metabolism, an example is vinegar. That is, would be made through respiratory metabolism pathway. Also included in our definition of fermented foods are foods that are made through microbial growth and enzymatic activity, but which we kill <laughs> those microbes at the end before we eat them. So foods where we expect live microbes from the ferment to be present at the time when we eat them would be yogurt, uh, kefir, uh, our fresh fermented fruits and vegetables that are not heat treated, um, most kombuchas, of course, there are foods where we don't have live microbes but are fermented. Example would be bread, because we, we bake the bread. Um, heat pasteurized or, or, or um, filtered foods, vinegar is an example, soy sauce. Of course, wine, beers, and distilled spirits. Coffee and chocolate. We also destroy the microbes before eating. But those foods would still be fermented. Just as we kind of define what is a fermented food, we should understand what is not. So here comes in that word desired. It's a subjective uh, definition in the fact that uh, we decide what is fermented and it's very close, if you will, to spoiled or rotting food. So we would say this, at least I would say this rotting head of cabbage <clears throat> is not fermented, is spoiled or rotting. So because it's not desirable, we wouldn't wanna eat that. Food with small quantities of a fermented ingredient we wouldn't include in as being fermented or where a microbe is added to the final product that wasn't needed for making that food, also not fermented. Salted or cured processed fish and meat would not be fermented. And lastly, one important point that I wanna make sure we leave with is that um, <clears throat> fruits and vegetables that are quick pickled will just add vinegar um, those would not be fermented. So foods that are made through chemicals, like acetic acid, um, when we add vinegar, those would not be fermented. 
So important to make that distinction. No microorganisms are needed. So now that we've defined what a fermented food is, um, what needs to happen to make a fermented food? And what's really elegant about all of this is that the same processes and steps we go through in our homes if we would make a fermented food happen at much larger scales if we're making foods for commercial consumption, such as wine, beer, cheese, bread, and so on. <clears throat> so what happens? Well, just as in the definition, we have microbial growth and enzymatic conversions of food components. And we need that, we know that. And what happens is we could start with any number of starting ingredients, milk, meat, fruits and vegetables, grains, legumes, cereals, and then what we do is we prepare them. We prepare them using really simple methods. Don't even necessarily think about this when we do it, but we're, we prepare them by chopping or cutting, salting or spicing, uh, perhaps packing them into a container, for certain fermented foods, we would want to soak and heat them. Uh, for example, in legume fermented foods, you need to start to break down the, 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 the legumes before they're fermented. Then in this process, we're going to adjust the conditions of those foods. The two are intertwined, be preturing and adjusting because as we um, uh, salt, we're changing water activity, we're changing temperature, maybe if we uh, store it on our countertop or put it at a higher temperature. So we're adjusting either aware, aware of it or in, um, in, intrinsic, intrinsically or extrinsically, and then we wait. So this is really fundamental to all fermented foods. We may be waiting hours as in the case of yogurt. We may be waiting days in the case of sauerkraut. We may be waiting months as in the case of fermented olives, or we may be waiting years for as an example with cheese and some wines. So how does this look? Just for example, we're making sauerkraut at home. We would start with a head of cabbage. We would start with some salt. We would cut the cabbage, shred it, and we would pack it into a mason jar, something like this. Where we weighed down the cabbage using um, a weight such as a bag of salt, we close the lid. What is happening? This is so simple, but what does this mean uh, for the ferment? What is the importance of each of these steps? Well, each is important. The first step of them is we're just providing microbes. <clears throat> that head of cabbage has the resource of microorganisms that are being needed to start and carry out the fermentation. By adding salt, we're changing the environment, not only adding flavors, but we're changing the environment that's gonna be exposed to the microorganisms. Salt will remove water uh, from the environment or let, make it less available for the microorganisms we don't wanna have there. Shredding, chopping uh, changes the food because it releases sugars, what the microbes will need to grow, releases nutrients, also needed other nutrients needed for the microbes to grow, gives a bigger surface area, so exposure to the food to allow those microbes to grow. And then we have those salt and the cabbage in that mason jar, we screw the lid on, that is removed, eliminating the oxygen or reducing oxygen exposure. We're setting the right stage for microbial growth. Next. We have that uh, mason jar, we have the jar on the counter, we wait approximately 20 days. First, we might see some gas, some bubbles forming, CO2, that's visual. We might also have a pH meter and we can see how the acid level increases or in other words, the pH goes down and we would want it to be below 4.6 to be safe. If we knew what, we looked at what compounds were in there, we would see lactic acid and acetic acid. So these are observations we can make. What's happening in a microbial perspective? From the microbial view, there's a lot going on. First of all, those microbes that were really abundant on that head of cabbage don't really do so well and, and die when they're exposed to high salt and low oxygen. So they're gonna, their numbers are gonna go down. Lactic acid bacteria, the microbes we really want to encourage in the food fermentation like leuconostoc and lactic lactobacillus they're gonna grow, 
and they're going to grow to high numbers, of typically over a million, 10 million, even 100 million cells of these bacteria per gram of the sauerkraut. So this is what we would see from a microbial point of view. You can see the succession of leuconostoc and lentibacillus over time. This is an unusual. This is what, that was one example of a, of a lacto-fermented uh, uh, food. Another is fermented olives. So we've been looking at fermented olives in collaboration with uh, uh, olive processors in Northern California or in Orland or Bill area for, for a number of years. And through this collaboration, we found that the, uh, the consistency of the lactic acid bacteria on the olives over time, just as in with sauerkraut, when the olives are submerged, they're gonna be, the lactic acid bacteria are gonna be in very low numbers. Within 15 days, they shoot up to over 10 million cells per gram and each olive is approximately uh, uh, two, two to three grams. Um, and then they're steady over time. And we see this happen repeatedly at different companies and whether the olives are collected early, mid, late in the season. Um, and these particular olives are in Sicilian style, so the big green ones, um, just submerged in, in some brine. What's different from sauerkraut is in olives fermentation, we expect to see yeast, so another group of organisms. They also start in very low numbers and those olives that are submerged grow rapidly, but you see they don't reach as high numbers. There are only about a thousand cells per gram on these olives. You can see here, um, it's very steady over time. <laughs> and olives are made over months, not just days or weeks. And um, all their evidence for those yeast would be that white pellicle you see at the top of the picture here, the, uh, of the olives in the picture here. So when we look a little closer, just as I pointed out for the sauerkraut fermentation, you're going to see the specific organisms that are in the olives. Um, whereas in sauerkraut, I pointed out leuconostoc and lactobacillus. We actually see very similar organisms when we look at these fermented olives. In the brine, shown here on the left, you see leuconostoc. These are organisms that are lactic acid bacteria abundant in the brine. And then in the olives over time, we see lactobacillus initially, and then pediococcus, another lactic acid bacteria. So we see this succession, the sort of dynamic process that's happening um, on these olives as they're being fermented. The same thing is happening with yeast. We see initially higher abundance of candida, boudiniae, and then we see a succession into pizia, another, another genus of yeast. So these are really dynamic ecosystems um, that, that happen uh, in, in when we make our foods. So that's from a microbial perspective, what's happening, what we need to make uh, fermented food. So for the remainder of my, of my talk, I want to um, highlight where we stand and where I think we need to go as we look at ferment, food fermentation science. And as a microbiologist, I'm going to take a a little biased, but microbial centric point of view, just because of how we need microorganisms to make fermented foods. We wouldn't have fermented foods without them. So ultimately what we want to be sure is to have safe, unspoiled and delicious ferments. So we want to have olives looking like those on the left and not with mold, for example, on the right. So we already know some things about the microorganisms in fermented foods. I've mentioned lactic acid bacteria a number of times here. Um, I always think about lacto-ferments. These would be the, the type of fermentation where we find high numbers of lactic acid bacteria where they're essential for making those foods. Um, what we know about these organisms is that they make lactic acid uh, during their metabolism using fermentation metabolism. We know that they're found pretty universally on plants, um, in the digestive tracts of, of animals, um, insects, and found in milk. And we know that when we apply salt and low oxygen, we can encourage their growth when they're there. So they're, they're tolerant to high, high salt, they're tolerant to acid environments, they grow well without oxygen, and they can grow at room temperature, for example. We know this about these bacteria. So we have a pretty good handle on, you know, 
who they are and, and basically what they can do um, and why we need them. But these are not the only organisms. Um, <clears throat> we also need fungi, for example, yeast, like I mentioned, in the olive fermentations, and probably the most famous would be Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the one we need for uh, breads <laughs> and uh, beer and wine, um, and even molds. So for example, for um, cheese, we would need organisms like Lactococcus. Um, we would need for uh, <clears throat> Emmental or cheese or Swiss cheese, we would see, need Propioni bacterium, another type of bacterium that gives us characteristic holes and flavors of that cheese. For kombucha, we would need Buchana acetobacter and Zygum saccharomyces um, for making kombucha. And for making foods like tempeh, we would need this mold called rhizopus. So really diverse microorganisms. And we really are just starting to get a handle on which microorganisms um, we need and which microorganisms may be coming into the food that we want to make sure we don't have. Um, so I'm gonna give an example here of some work we've done um, looking at uh, milk and um, cheese making. Uh, so what you see here are, is a list of the uh, types of bacteria we find in raw milk and relative proportion you know, of the total abundance. This would be milk that has about a thousand um, uh, cells of microorganisms or bacteria per mil. Um, so not a lot of microbes, but really diverse. Um, raw milk just is a zoo of microorganisms. And you can see here where Streptococcus is most abundant. Um, that is one example of a milk microbe, Pseudomonas, and we can go on, right? But this is raw milk. Um, when we look at it, we could say it's highly diverse. But it's, it, is, it does show a pattern. So this would be milk um, collected at different times of year, spring, summer, fall in California. And what we found is that the microbial composition in that raw milk really changes depending on when the time of year. Uh, so for example, in the summer, the raw milk contains high proportion, high numbers or high relative quantities of Streptococcus and Staphylococcus. That changes in other times of year where um, in the spring, actinobacteria frequently found in soil were more abundant. Our Bactoroidetes microbes you might find more associated with um, the intestine or more abundant in the fall. So there are certain patterns that we start to see when we look at the microbial contents of the raw ingredients. Keeping in mind, these microbes, many will be killed through pasteurization, but those that might affect the quality of the final product, um, you know, they might be safe, but they might cause spoilage issue, may, may, may make it through. When we move into the actual pasteurization, uh, we see uh, a reflection of that diversity of the mi microorganisms in the milk. So into a high temperature short time treatment pasteurizer, we see a certain composition of microorganisms and what comes out the other side is different. And it also changes over time in the course of a single pasteurizer. This is at a, 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 a company that makes, uh, a, a dairy that makes cheese. So, this was at a commercial scale. But you can see just the diversity, the variety, the changes in the proportions and, um, over time. And how might we apply that? So um, again, using milk and cheese as an example, um, a common uh, defect in cheddar cheese is the is, uh, slits or cracks shown in the bottom in image here. So looking at the microbial profile in milk, before and after pasteurization um, and knowing that we're following this milk all the way to making cheddar cheese and looking at that cheese, whether it has cracks or not, we can start to imagine which microorganisms are responsible for those slits and cracks. We, we really didn't know. So this is this was kind of where we're looking at what, what causes these slits and cracks in the cheddar cheese. And what we found is that the milk that was used to make this cheese was already telling us something. It was telling us some, based on the microorganisms present that um, certain microbial patterns 
resulted in cheese that had slits. And so that, that's what we're seeing here in a kind of a statistical way where uh, we look at the total microbial contents of, of the milk that results in, in, in cheese with or without slits. And you see how they're not overlapping. Um, taking a deeper look at which taxa were there, we found that, that higher proportions of lactobacillus, certain lactobacillus species in milk that was associated with slit or crack formation in cheddar cheese. When we look at the cheese, we see that same thing, where we see higher proportions of certain lactobacillus in cheese that has slits or cracks. And then we probe even further still by isolating members of those lactic acid bacteria, in this case, lactic, lactobacillus fermentum, we apply them or add them back into cheese curds and make cheese, we were able to recreate those slits or cracks, showing that um, this organism was responsible for the slits and cracks. So when we go back and we look at the milk, the milk prior to pasteurization, um, we could see that that milk indeed had higher levels of that organism. Um, it survived pasteurization and it was in very low numbers, but it was sufficient to, to cause gas formation um, this is a, a lactic acid bacterium that makes carbon dioxide and it was sufficient to cause slits and cracks. So that's an example from cheese. But this is common. So it's not just there where we can identify the microbes that cause these spoilage defects. We've also, as I mentioned, had them looking at fermented olives. And one of the big issues in, in fermented olives and, and many fermented fruits and vegetables is um, a loss of the structure uh, of the fruits and vegetables due to pectinolytic yeast. So this is something that we've shown where you see an, a beautiful olive that you want to eat on the top picture and then at the bottom you see an olive that has the right taste or sensory uh, smells, aromas, but it is really mushy. Um, and so what we were able to show that a uh, certain yeasts that are highly pectinolytic, meaning they can break down the pectin contents of uh, the olive, cause the spoilage. So that's what we see here. We were able to isolate those yeasts and put them back into some test fermentations, and they, uh, they resulted in that, those mushy olives. Um, what's important here is that these spoilage microbes don't need to be in high abundance to cause spoilage. Um, just as we saw with the cheese um, and, and lactobacillus fermentum, we see with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we only had in the cheese about 1% of the total microorganisms was, was this uh, spoilage microbe. And in, in the olives, it was about 5 to 10% of the yeast present. So you don't need a high number of these spoilage microbes to cause um, spoilage. And that brings me to my final point here, is that as we start to really um, understand and explore the microorganisms that we need for human fermentations and those that we don't want to have there because they cause, cause spoilage um, or other defects, uh, we need to start looking beyond species to look at strains. So I want to just leave you also with definition for strain or an isolate of a microbial species that is genetically distinct from other members of that species. Show this here as we go through our taxonomic ladder and you'll be familiar probably with um, E. coli or Escherichia coli, which we know is a species. But to really understand E. coli or Lactobacillus fermentum, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, any of these microorganisms, we need to know them at the single strain genetic level. And why is that? Is because microbial diversity is vast. Um, microorganisms are highly unrelated. Uh, or, or they look more related than they are when we give them a name. For example, if we took lactobacillus, they're only 70% genetically related. And if we did the same thing for us, we would be the same species as uh, lemurs. <laughs> and so as we start to understand the microbial diversity and composition of these foods. We, we look at the strain level, as we've done for Lactoplanty bacillus plantarum. Um, you can see it's really diverse. So uh, 
different capacities to metabolize carbohydrates, different tolerances to salt and ethanol and, and pH stress. So one can start to imagine how we would end up with um, sauerkraut, but my sauerkraut might taste different from your, yours, just depending on the types of microorganisms that happen to be in, in that head of cabbage at the strain level. And so as we think about this, and as we think about how we're doing our food fermentations at home or food fermentations at a company, um, we're, we're thinking about where those microbes are coming from. So most fermentations today come from uh, uh, spontaneous or uh, artisanal ferments where uh, the microbes are coming in from that head of cabbage as ingredients or the environment. Um, we also have ferments where there, uh, we have backslapping, where we add in a prior ferment, as in, some, as in sourdough, for example. In those ferments, strains are variable and not defined. On the other hand, we have a few fermentations uh, that have defined cultures, starter cultures, uh, where they're added specifically. And there, there's just a few, for example, yogurt or beer. And for them, we would actually know their genome sequences and enzymatic properties defined at the strain level. So summary and what's next. So I want to leave you with, fermented foods are defined as foods and beverages made through desired microbial growth and enzymatic conversions of food components. Although the general process for making fermented foods is quite simple, there's a lot of complexity that would affect the safety and sensory qualities of the final food product. By defining the required microorganisms and their activities in fermented foods, it will be possible to preserve knowledge on traditional fermented foods, improve consistency, preventing spoilage, for example, design new fermented foods, and as a teaser for next time, understand the health benefits of fermented foods. So coming back to our Eat Lack project, I want to put a plug that we are um, a community science uh, project and we are really interested to receive your home ferments to understand, identify which microorganisms are present. We're really still at the exploration phase in many fermented foods, especially those made at home. So we look forward to hopefully receiving some for you or thank you if you've already submitted um, because we're really just discovering this microbial world and these fresh fermented fruits and vegetables. With that, I wanna thank my laboratory, um, <clears throat> UC Davis, and my, and my number of uh, funding agencies. And, I, and just to uh, <clears throat> leave you with one last comment, um, another webinar series that um, I'm involved in is taking a, a bigger view on the idea of fermentation, particularly as it relates to indigenous foods um, in the Arctic, and it's called Radical and Relational Approaches to Food Fermentation and Sovereignty. Um, so you're welcome to reach out if you have questions about this or um, join our webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Marco. A lot of great information. Now we're gonna transition and I'm going to show um, a video related to producing fermented fruits and vegetables at home, just kind of a general introduction to the process. So for those of you that have not tried your hand at home fermentation, this will give you um, some pointers uh, for starting out. Um, I just want to mention because several people have asked, we are going to be recording these webinars and we'll make that content available at the Eat Black website. So I'll be sure to provide that um, website URL in the chat as well. If you've never fermented fruits and vegetables at home, here are some general tips to follow. It is important to have appropriate equipment for preparing fermented fruits and vegetables. The fermentation vessel can be ceramic, glass, or food grade plastic. It is important to create a low or no oxygen environment during fermentation. Oftentimes weights are used to keep the fruits and vegetables under the brine. 
You can purchase specialized fermentation weights or use something else you have like a plate, jar, or food grade plastic bag filled with brine or canning salt to weight down the ingredients. The fermentation process generates carbon dioxide gas. So the container should have an airlock or be routinely burped or opened to release the gas. Washing your hands and equipment sanitation is key to ensuring a successful ferment. All equipment should be cleaned using soap and potable water to remove any soils that might be present. This can also be accomplished using an automatic dishwasher. Sanitation is a process to inactivate unwanted microbes that might be present on a surface. Equipment can be sanitized by submerging in boiling water for 10 minutes or by running through a dishwasher on the sanitizing cycle. There are, there are also some chemical sanitizers that can be purchased from home brewing supply shops. You should ensure a sanitizer is labeled for use on food contact surfaces and that you follow the label directions in exactly in terms of chemical concentration, application, and removal instructions. Common kitchen disinfectants are not suitable for sanitizing fermentation equipment. It is important to select high quality fruits and vegetables for fermentation. Those that have already begun to spoil will not ferment well. The microbes that cause spoilage will outcompete those responsible for fermentation. Inspect the produce before you start. Remove any stems or leaves from produce prior to fermentation. Also discard any fruit or vegetable that has visible signs of damage or that has begun to spoil. After you have inspected your produce, rinse the produce under cool running water. Do not use soap or other sanitizers on the produce. Not to worry, rinsing will remove any dirt or other debris, but, but not the native microbes that will contribute to fermentation. Fruits and vegetables need to stay submerged in brine at all times during fermentation. This helps create the low oxygen environment fermentation microorganisms need to thrive. If your fruits and vegetables are not completely submerged in brine, you can supplement with additional brine as needed. In many cases, a weight will be needed to keep the fruit and vegetables submerged in the brine. You can use food grade plastic grates, food grade plastic bags filled with brine or canning salt, jars filled with brine or canning salt, or specialized fermentation weights. You can find reliable fermentation recipes from the USDA and cooperative extension arms of land grant universities. The recipes will specify using canning or pickling salt give specific ratios of ingredients and the approximate length of time needed for the fermentation to be complete. Once you have set up the fermentation, it is important to monitor the process over time. Once complete, fresh fermented fruits and vegetables can be stored in the refrigerator and enjoyed over the next several months. You can find fermentation recipes and facts on the EatLock website or by following the project on social media. All right, well, hopefully um, you were able to view that video. One of our students let me know that the, the quality was a little bit poor, probably because of my Wi-Fi at home. So we'll make sure that video is available at eatlock.org uh, as well. Um, so if it didn't come through, we'll have that posted online so you can have a look. Um, so I think in the time remaining, um, we'll go ahead and jump into some questions. We received a number uh, of questions related to the content of today's webinar um, as folks were registering. Um, so I'll kind of start out with some of those and then the others that were in the chat that I think are relevant to today's talk, we'll, we'll jump into those as well. Um, so Professor Marco, this is kind of a, a follow up on some things you already talked about, um, but I know you're highly involved and on the board of directors for the International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics or ISAP as it's commonly referred to. Um, and you presented the definition um, of fermented foods from that group. I was just wondering if you could give us a little bit um, of an idea of 
you know, what this association's mission is. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so the association is uh, really focused on uh, providing uh, accurate scientific knowledge on uh, the topic of uh, sort of beneficial microbes that could like, improve our health. For example, probiotics, prebiotics. Um, we've included fermented foods in this list um, uh, through, you know, mainly through uh, our digestive tract. Um, but yeah, I, I, when I come to the talk next week, I'll explain the difference between probiotics and fermented foods. That's often a, a question. Um, so yeah, I, I, there's wonderful resources actually provided by ISAP, videos, uh, infographics. Um, so you know, trying to, to fairly evaluate the science on, on these topics. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, where else should we go next? Um, there were, there was a question, a few questions pre-submitted and then another one I saw that came through the chat related to, um, whether or not vegetables that were submerged in vinegar or quick pickled or considered a fermented food, um, so I don't know if you want to maybe address that and I, I can jump in as needed. Yeah, of course, it'd be great to have your perspective on this too. But, you know, really the definition of a fermented food is you need to have microbial growth and enzymatic activity. And when you just add vinegar um, and then can, you're, you're not... Um, having microbial growth, you're probably, you're killing microbes <laughs> if there's any remaining. So, uh, you know, that would be, um, it's a little confusing um, and it is confusing um, the way it's described um, in different cultures, um, the way pickled, fermented. So I think we should just kind of be aware of that confusion and, um, you know, inquire when we can to ask, uh, for example, as a consumer, whether the food is, is fermented or, or just um, more vinegar is added. Uh, so that's, you know, the big, the big thing is time. In making a fermented food, you're, you're gonna require some time um, before that food is ready, ready to eat. And usually that's days <laughs> um, uh, or weeks rather than just uh, an hour or two. Erin, did you have any other? Yeah, and I, I, that, yeah. I think just for someone that's interested in, in home food preserving, home canning, home fermenting, um, there's, there's certainly different safety considerations when we're talking about a cucumber that's made by adding vinegar directly uh, to those um, vegetables or fruits compared to a fermented product. Um, so it's important that it, you know, if you are someone interested in, in doing some home preservation that you, you know, kind of understand the differences there, um, as the video that apparently no one could really see clearly mentioned, there are some really reliable resources out there for home food preservers. Um, so the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning is a great resource. The National Center for Home Food Preservation out of University of Georgia has a lot of publications around producing both types of, of what we call pickled products. So those that are truly fermented um, and also those that are gonna be um, pickled by adding vinegar directly. In California, we also have a wonderful resource which is our statewide master food preserver program. So there are a number of counties here in California that have active master food preserver programs. I'll be sure to share um, the links to that program. And so uh, the master food preservers hold public educational events and workshops that really get into um, the techniques for fermenting at home as well as producing other home preserved products and help Anyone attending those workshops or educational events understand, you know, the differences in terms of safety and processing that you have to consider um, with these different preservation techniques. Mm -hmm. 
Um, let's see, where shall we go next? Um, one of the questions that was pre-submitted was related to fermented foods that are expected to contain alcohol. Um, so, you know, I know you touched on a wide variety of different types of fermented foods, but just, you know, kind of as, as a general knowledge, what types of fermented foods would we expect for alcohol to be produced? And if you could just speak a bit to the microorganisms that, that produce alcohol as a byproduct of their growth. Yeah, so really these are the foods that have high quantities of yeast. Uh, as we would know for uh, alcoholic fermentations, uh, beer, wine, and spirits. Um, I know with um, uh, foods like kombucha, we could find higher, um, perhaps undesirable levels of ethanol. Um, and that's a consequence of these, what's often just a wild fermentation, um, it, you know, having potentially unwanted levels of, of ethanol. Um, so I, you know, I, that would be kind of the answer is just, we, we know that these would be yeast led ferments and, um, you know, if we're letting them, we're doing this at home or, you know, even in sometimes in industry that it's really hard, to, in, unless it's a really defined culture, how to uh, control fermentation to avoid it. Let's see. Um, I, I kind of, I, I thought this question was interesting and it kind of piggybacks on one of the last points that you were, you were making just about the diversity of these microorganisms involved in fermentation and how, you know, we really have to get down to the strain level um, when we're talking about microorganisms that impart you know, different characteristics to a fermentation. Um, so a question came in from one of our registrants. Um, is there, is it for fermented fruits and vegetables in particular, is there a robust kind of catalog or do we know specifically any uh, strains of lactic acid bacteria that impart certain flavors or characteristics to a product that, you know, someone that's a small processor could go and say, I want to, you know, an extra kind of tangy pickle. These are the strains I want to pick out of this catalog and start with. Yeah, uh, for that, you would um, need to turn to a, a culture house, a company that uh, would sell starter cultures where you would have defined um, strains that were selected and, and characterized for their properties. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of options now for fermented fruits and vegetables. Uh, for yogurt and cheeses, that's uh, much further developed um, where uh, individual isolates, which we call strains, have been really examined for their those types of properties. Um, so we definitely need more of that sort of thing for just about all fermentations, um, except for a, a, you know, a few where those have been pretty well developed by culture houses. But if you really want to do this, you know, you can reach out to culture house to companies that can provide these strains. Um, I, I saw also a, a question in, in the chat about slimy, <laughs> um, slimy um, fermented vegetables. And again, this comes down to strain differences. Um, so slimy can be through making polysaccharides that are uh, released into the brine by some lactic acid bacteria, in particular leuconostoc. Um, a lactic acid bacteria is good at making polysaccharides that make it slimy sort of texture. So that's, that can just be a consequence of which microbes are present on the fruits and vegetables, the ingredients that go into the ferment um, and thus kind of hard to control. <laughs> well, great. I think um, probably in the interest of time, we should wrap the questions up now. 
Not to worry if we didn't get to your question in this webinar, we've been keeping a, a list of the questions that have come in through the chat. We also have a list of all the questions that came in uh, through the registration. So we'll be addressing those as we continue uh, these webinars in the future. Um, I did uh, just want to point everyone to our website. Our project's website is eatlock.org. I saw some questions related to submitting samples to contribute to the citizen science piece of the project. Um, so we would love to, to get more samples to support um, this research. So please check out the website. There are very detailed instructions about how to get samples to us um, as part of the, the project. And right now, putting a link to the evaluation survey in the chat. So if you would just take a minute and open up um, the survey and provide us feedback, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, for those that don't have the opportunity to go ahead and open this uh, survey up now, we'll make sure that that also can uh, be distributed via email um, later uh, if needed. So um, just on behalf of Professor Marco and myself and our whole ELAC team, I really thank you for jo joining us today. We were really excited to see the number of people that were interested in, in learning more about fermented foods. I suspect many, if not all of you, um, are doing some of this uh, on your own right now. So we hope the information that we presented here today um, was informative and of interest to you. Um, the survey that you're participating in is completely anonymous. So, um, you know, feel free to, to provide any comments you had on the content um, in that survey. Um, I apologize again for the, the quality of the video, but I'll make that available on our EVAC uh, website as well. Um, so you'll be able to, to view that. Um, I just want to give another plug for next week's webinar. I think um, many of you have probably already registered for our second webinar in the series, The Benefits of Fermenting Food. I think Professor Marco gave a couple teasers about what we're going to talk about in that next webinar. So that will be next Friday, February 19th at noon Pacific time. Um, so we're going to be talking a bit about how the fermentation process changes. Uh, the fundamental properties of food um, and the benefits associated with those changes. Um, we'll get into probiotics, prebiotics, and you know what we know to date about health benefits associated um, with the consumption of fermented foods. So if you've already registered for that webinar, we'll be um, sending a reminder email out to you uh, next week. It's the same Zoom login information as today. Um, but we'll, we'll make sure to send out a reminder. So if it's not in your calendar yet, um, we'll, we'll prompt you to add it in next week. So with that, I just want to say thanks again, everyone. Have a great weekend. Happy fermenting if you're getting into that a bit. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you.